Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault Podcast. I'm your host, RJ McCready. And for this episode, I have a listener request from my good buddy, Darren Randall. And he's asked me if I could do an episode on the anti-Kifra mechanism. Now, some of you may be going, what is that? And some of you may be going, yeah, I know what that is because I saw that in all the old mystery books back in the day. It's um, actually in the PG Tip Mystery collection, which I've mentioned before. Remember those little cards that you used to be able to get out of the old tea bag boxes back in the 80s? Um, but yeah, a, a rough, small synopsis on this before I go into a little bit of depth for this is it's a. Um, it's a mechanism. It's basically what they, they say. It's like the oldest analog computer in the world. It's about 2,000 years old. It's Greek. And it's basically a uh, analog device which um, predicts uh, astronomical position eclipses, um, which are decades in advance. And it also predicts the or calculates the four-year cycle of the Olympic game. So it is... It's a very advanced device which was overlooked many, many years ago when it was discovered in 1901 by sponge divers off the um, island of Antikythera, which is on the Aegean Sea. It's just on the cusp of the Aegean Sea um, by the Mediterranean. Um, so it's somewhere close to the island of Crete, which is probably a little bit more familiar to, to you guys. Uh, listening to this episode just gives you a rough idea but um, Antikythera is like a, a tiny tiny little island. So let's turn back the clock to 1901 with this um, crew of sponge divers and the captain of the ship was Demetrios Kontos and back in those times, I didn't know this actually believe it or not, um, they used to collect the sponges from, from the seabed, they used to make a lot of money out of that um, obviously for, for bathing um, and this crew they got caught up in a storm they were supposed to be heading towards uh, North Africa they ended up on the Aegean Sea after the storm off the island of Antikythera and the captain said well let's just have a look around here shall we you know whilst we're here you know let's, let's dive and one of the divers went down in one of those old diving bell suits you know the ones that are made out of um brass got a brass helmet on it and it's got like a, a tube attached to the back of it is it it's all very sort of to me that's kind of like romantic times of diving and it's usually the little figure that you see in a goldfish uh, bowl that's the first impression that i get anyway i <laughs> i'm segwaying um so anyway dives goes down to the uh, seabed and then he comes up with a bronze hand and he says there is lots of like horses and statues and busts and he's like I've never seen anything like it before in my life so basically this ship has hit the jackpot and what makes me laugh here you know just to mention there's so many people out there treasure hunting looking for lost treasures particularly the guys on Oak Island that spent years and years and years looking for treasure and you get a ship in this case back in 1901 it gets uh you know taken off course with a storm and they dive and they hit the jackpot so there you go that's a that's kind of like a mystery itself but anyway they've, they've hit the jackpot they, and they've basically found a wreck going back to uh they reckon it goes back to around about 200 uh bc uh it's a greek vessel which has carried a, an awful lot of treasure um which was apparently going to rome and this ship, um, archaeologists have, have looked at o over the years up until today, is about 300 foot, foot long. So it's a huge ship for the time and archaeologists over the years have found, you know, statues of Greek philosophers, horses. Um, they've also found like pottery, vases, um, so a whole ton of, ton of stuff. So going back to the sponge divers, they did everything right in this case. They recorded the location and they went to the Greek government to, to report their findings. And it worked out very well for them because the Greek government then employed them to go back and retrieve these items. Because back in 1901, there wasn't anything like um, marine archaeology. This was actually one of the first cases of marine archaeology. Um, 
So they go back to the location and they retrieve all these goods and they, they find, like say, the statues, the bus, the vases. And then amongst all those items, and it's item 15087, to be precise, is a clock. Now they pull it out of the water, it's in a, it's in a wooden box which is containing um, brass mechanisms. And as you can imagine, amongst all the treasure that they're finding, they kind of just overlook this item at this time, but they bring it out of the water and they record it, and then they take it back to the museum. Now, the thing back in this time was with the, the marine archaeology, and even up until today, it's, it's difficult to try and pres to preserve these items. So as the clock came out of the water and it it was exposed to oxygen, it started to fall apart. So it gets taken back to the museum. There's this fantastic story, and I'm sure all the sailors go down the down to the pub and start drinking and telling all these tales, and it's all great. Uh, fast forward up until 1950, it's not until the, the museum creators start looking at this device and go, that's a bit strange. It's got cogs on it and it's 2,000 years and they shouldn't have that. So a, I think it's a professor called Derek De Solo Price. Um, he actually brought out a book called The Gears from the Greeks in 1974. He started to, to study the machine and his first impression was, looking at it, was that it was some sort of um, analogue device stroke computer. In basic terms, could tell the time, but not only that, could um, predict the eclipse, the lunar eclipse. Um, it, it charted out the ancient planets um, back, in, back in the Greek times and then, obviously, as I mentioned before, it, it also um, tells you when the next um, Olympic Games are going to be on in the four year cycle but this was with, a, with an awful lot of study and then he brought out a book which I've just mentioned which is the Gears from the Greeks since 1974 and when he let the world know that there was this mechanism um, nobody professionally really wanted to know because I think they were scared that well not scared, they were just like I think they just wanted to stick their head in the sand, basically saying this is just what I've I've taken from the research I've done. It's like the Greeks shouldn't have that, so let's just pretend they didn't, because that's kind of kind of mess things up a little bit. Um, there's no way they should have had technology like that back 2,000 years ago. And I think what scientists were saying back in that time in the 70s was that they acknowledged the fact that Greeks had um, basic knowledge of the planets and cycles but not to this extent not not where they've got a, like a computer analog machine that can um, help them out with that. now at the same time when this book got released um, this is a good time to mention this as well you I've mentioned this guy before it's Eric von Daniken the chariots of the gods um, he, he is the man who is heavily involved in the theory that aliens have visited this planet now I don't think this really helped the um, Derek de Solo Price book at the time because um, Eric von Daniken found out about the machine and he jumped on the fact that it must have been from an advanced alien race which I've mentioned before and <laughs> you know me I've always got to mention aliens of this because that is one of the theories out there um, for this but I don't think that is the case as much as I've delved into that um, I, I, I think that the Greeks were more advanced in in this area than, than we think they, they were um, but I thought I'd mention that as well because I've got to mention aliens with this um, so yes, um, so over the years, um, certainly in the sort of recent times, the 2000s, I think this is when the, the Antikythera mechanism was taken a little bit more seriously because we have, our technology's got a little bit better as well, so we've got um, CT scans and you can see all this stuff on YouTube, it's great where they've scanned the device and it's brought it out to even more of a spectacular I guess you could say because they've worked out that there is actually um, 223 gears to this mechanism now I've looked into the actual analogs and watchmaking 
And just to give you an idea for a watchmaker, I didn't realise this, but to actually make a watch and sync it with time is actually quite difficult. And just to sort of explain this in basic terms, if you took a watch, and, or if you asked a watchmaker to make, um, let's just say, a basic watch which tells the time, it will say, yep, yeah, that's fine, I can do that. But if you, if you said, could you make a watch that tells you the lunar cycle and the eclipse and all the planets into one watch the the gist i'm getting here from from that is watchmaker will scratch their head and go that's going to be a little bit difficult because to try and sync that all together you've got to put a lot of cogs in into the system and i'm trying to keep this very sort of simple basically what they're saying is because the lunar cycle can have i think there's so many cycles over say like 5,000 years to try and sync that would be incredibly hard if you're trying to sync time as well. Um, so what the watchmakers today are saying about this device is if this is 2,000 years old and they've worked a way out to do that 2,000 years ago is, is kind of what makes this like a bit of a sort of wow factor. You know, we these guys had this type of technology back then so I think that's a fascinating thing about the Antikythera mechanism itself is that the Greeks have worked out something that today we are still struggling with in those basic terms if you, if you asked a watchmaker to make this from from scratch so that kind of if that kind of gives you that idea and then I'd look at when, when you first had a astronomical clock and the um, first time they were recorded was in the 14th century. And then in the 18th century you had a mechanism called an orrery. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's like a mechanical model of the, of the solar system. You see where you have the sun and then you have the planets going around. You'll see it in like a, a, a science museum. Um, and then whilst we're on this subject as well, I had a quick look at time. Um, because I was just interested, because I never really thought about it. I thought, when, when did we start recording time? Apparently, it was about 3,000 years ago in Egypt, um, where they had sun dials, and obviously, time isn't, wasn't precise, as precise as, as we have it now, but then they recognized a way of being able to record it somehow with a sundial. Um, and then obviously, if you go right back to the sort of early Neanderthal times, obviously humans were aware that you had basically had the sort of day um, and night cycles. And then obviously, you go into the um, like Stonehenge um, type monuments, which are scattered all over the world. But then that's that's for another um, episode. Um, so let's have a quick talk about uh, how big this uh, device is. So it's 34 centimeters by 18 centimeters by 9 uh, so it's 13 inches 7 inches by three and a half so it's about the size of a of, a, of like a sort of one of those big sort of coffee table books it's not it's not very big it's quite compact and it has been rebuilt today it's quite spectacular for the time check out the pictures on on Google um, and people played about it I think someone made it out made redesign one out of Lego um, I think as I mentioned earlier with the watchmaker I think there's three watches based on this which um, I imagine are worth a whole ton of money and so I think it's safe to say that scientists today have, have a good idea what this mechanism is but who made it back in those times so um, there's a couple of ideas there's a couple of theories I believe that it could possibly have been made by the Greek mathematician Archimedes um, who was around about in that time because what they did was they they have synced the mechanism to the first possible solar eclipse going back to 205 BC where Archimedes would have been around about that time also there was a mathematician from Rhodes or an astronomer called uh, Hippocrates <laughs> Sorry guys, I can't pronounce his names. Um, but he was also... The fingers are pointed towards him as someone who possibly um, designed this mechanism. So, you know, but they you know, they don't know because there's there's lots of things here 
Uh, they don't know what the name of the ship is. They're only guessing where, where, where it was going at those times. They think it was possibly going to Rome. Um, they don't really know who's made it. They're only just guessing. Um, so there's an awful lot of mystery surrounding this. They also believe that there's possibly other cogs missing as well. Uh, but like I say, what they do know is that it's, it's aligned up to the ancient planets, which is Mercury, Venus, Mars, um, Jupiter and Saturn. And as I mentioned before, with the you know the eclipse and the lunar eclipse and time, um, but I suppose you know, as, as a bit of a roundup, it's like what else is on that ship that they that is still there to be discovered because there's still people diving on it today. That's the other thing I've got to mention. Jack Cousteau, the famous diver, he he got involved in this as well, in this project, uh, back in the 1950s and the 1970s. Um, so apart from it being a mystery, it is also the birth of underwater archaeological um, excavation. So it's, you know, it's a biggie. It's, it's quite a biggie, this one. Um, so that's about it on, on, on a roundup. Um... I suppose the only, the only other thing I need to say with this, which is the, the, the thing that's different to other mysteries that I have looked into investigate, is that the anti-Kifra mechanism is a real thing. It's something that is, is there in, in your hands. It's not like um, the Lost Ark, shall we say, where it's just a theory and we don't know what it is. Really, this this is a device that you can actually hold in your hand. Well, you probably you don't want to hold it in your hand because it probably disappear. But um, this is the different with this artifact from that time is that it is real. And this is the other thing. It's like people have said, well, could it have just been dropped in the water? Could it have been made today and dropped into the water? Well, I thought about that and I thought, well, no, I don't think so because what is the chances of? making this mechanism even back in the sort of 1900s and then taking it out off the island of Antikythera and just dropping it in the ocean on this site I I don't think so I, don't, I, I think this is real unless of course you know someone has done that I mean could you imagine that would be a fluke itself but no I don't think so I think the Antikythera mechanism is real um, and I think, as a final thought of the day, if they found that, and I think I've spoken to Darren about this before, it's like, what else is out there that we don't know about or they've got and they don't want to tell us? And so that could be the, I would say that'd be the thought of the day. But it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's a great um, story. It's a great bit of technology. I think it's fantastic that they had technology back in those times. And I think there's a few surprises for us in store, you know, with as as long as archaeological digs go on. You know, there may be some stuff out there where they might, you know, find an ancient iPhone or something like that. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to find out. Um, but that's about it. So that kind of rounds up that story. Um, hopefully, if you've, if you've never heard of this before, hopefully now with that sort of 20 minute insight you can go away and say yeah I know a little bit more about the anti kiffer mechanism or if you may go away and say oh I actually want to know a little bit more about that you can go on to google it there's there's a lot more detail on it and like say there's pictures um it, it it's a great little mystery um and it's a great device itself oh and I forgot to mention as well um I actually looked into is there anything else that they have actually found and there is um it was actually the um, Baghdad ba battery they found um, in Iraq. Uh, 2,000 year old pot which contained what they believe to be a battery and they think they used it for electroplating back in those times so that's quite advanced. So as I said there is um, a lot of this ancient technology kicking around so um, yeah it's, it's a cool subject. Um, take a take a look into it so um there you go guys hope you enjoyed that um i'm just going to wrap up the episode before i do that let's do a little bit of um admin for the show i am a proud member of the legion podcast network so please go and check out all the other shows on there including my other show which is bite Size cinema podcast where i dropped um several episodes per month my latest one is crawl 
Um, so go and check that out. And you can also follow me on Facebook. And you can listen to the show on several platforms, including iTunes, Spotify, uh, YouTube. And you can find the show if you type in uh, the Mystery Vault podcast into into Google. Um, so yeah, that's about it, guys. So as always, keep it spooky, keep it safe, and I will see you soon. Because one of you sitting here in this room. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.